The sages said, O oh, foremost among those who know everything, Please explain the nature of bondage and liberation. Sutta said, I shall explain bondage, liberation, and the means of liberation. Please listen attentively. A jiva is said to be in bondage if he is tied up by the noose of the eightfold primary tattvas, prakriti, etc. When freed from them, he is called liberated. Perfect control and subjugation of prakriti and its offshoots is moksha, salvation. A jiva, when freed from bondage, is called a liberated soul. The set of eight that binds is prakriti, buddhi, cosmic intellect, ahankar, cosmic ego, of the nature of attributes, and the five tanmatras, the cosmic principles of earth, water, air, fire, and space. The body is evolved out of these eight. The body carries on activities. The activities generate the body. Thus, birth and activities continue in a mutually generating series. The body is of three types, gross, subtle, and causal. The gross body is responsible for all activities. The subtle body yields the enjoyment of pleasures through the senses. The causal body experiences the good and bad results of the jiva's activities. The jiva experiences happiness as a result of virtue and misery as a result of sin. The jiva, bound by the rope of activities, revolves round and round forever like a wheel by means of the three types of body and their activities. For the cessation of the revolution of the wheel of karma, the creator of the wheel must be worshipped. The creator of the wheel is the Lord Shiva. Prakriti, etc., constitute the great wheel, and Shiva is beyond Prakriti. Just as a boy drinks or spits out water as he pleases, so Shiva keeps Prakriti, etc., just as he pleases. Shiva alone is omniscient, perfect, and free from desire. He is called Shiva because he has brought Prakriti under his Vasikrita, control. The mental prowess of Maheshwara, which the Vedas alone can comprehend, consists of omniscience, satiety, beginningless understanding, independence, unfailing, and infinite power. Hence, Prakriti, etc., come under control due to Shiva's grace. One shall worship Shiva alone for the acquisition of Shiva's grace. If one were to ask, how can there be a selfless worship of a perfect being? The answer is, an activity done with dedication to Shiva shall cause pleasure to him. Keeping Shiva in view, the devotee shall worship the phallic or the embodied image of Shiva or his devotee. He shall worship his devotee by means of the body, mind, speech, and money spent. Shiva, the great Lord who is beyond Prakriti, is delighted at the worship and specially blesses the worshiper. Then karma, etc., come under control gradually due to Shiva's grace. When everything beginning with karma and ending with prakriti comes under control, the jiva is called liberated, and he shines as a self-realized person. By the grace of Shiva, when this karma deha, the body which is the result of activities, comes under control, the devotee attains residence in Shiva Loka. This is called the Saloka form of liberation. When the subtle elements come under control, the devotee attains nearness to Shiva. 
Then he attains similarity with Shiva in form, weapons, and activities. This is called sarupya. When the devotee acquires the great favor of Shiva, the cosmic intellect, too, comes under control. The cosmic intellect is only an effect of prakriti. The control of intellect is called sarshti, a form of liberation wherein the devotee has the same rank and power as Shiva. Then, due to a further great favor of Shiva, prakriti comes under control. The mental prowess of Shiva becomes his without any difficulty. On acquiring the omniscience and prosperity of Shiva, the devotee becomes resplendent in his soul. This is called sayuja, complete identity, by persons well-versed in the Vedas and Agamas, traditional sacred texts. It is in this order that one gets salvation by the worship of the phallic image of Shiva. Hence, the devotee shall worship Shiva by performing sacred rites, etc., for the acquisition of Shiva's favor. Shiva's sacred rites, Shiva's penance, and japa of Shiva mantras always. Knowledge of Shiva and meditation on him shall be practiced more and more. The time till retirement to bed, the time till death, shall be spent in contemplating over Shiva. He shall adore Shiva by means of the sadyo mantras and flowers. He will attain welfare. The sages said, O oh, excellent one of good rites, please explain the rules governing worship of Shiva in the phallic and other forms. Sutta said, I shall explain, O Brahmanas, the procedure of the worship of the phallic form. Please listen. The first phallic form is the pranava that confers all desires. It is called sukshma pranava, subtle, if it is nishkala. The stula pranava, gross, is sakala, consisting of five letters. The worship of these two is called tapas, penance. Both of them accord salvation. There are many phallic emblems in Paurusha Prakriti. Shiva alone can explain them in detail, no one else. Those evolved of earthly material are known to me. I shall explain them to you. These are of five types, Svayambhu, Bindu, Pratishtita, Chara, and Guru Linga. When he is gladdened by the austerities of devas and sages, Shiva in the form of Nada assumes the form of a seed under the ground, and suddenly piercing the ground above like a germinating sprout, manifests himself outside and makes his presence felt. Since this emblem is self-raised, it is called Svayambhu. By worshipping it, the devotee gains increasing knowledge automatically. In a gold or silver plate, or on the ground or an altar, the devotee draws the picture of the phallic emblem of the pure pranava mantra and shall invoke it with the rites of pratishta and avahana. The bindu and nada forms, both stationary and mobile, are conceptual, but undoubtedly belong to Shiva. Wherever Shiva is sincerely believed to be present, the Lord bestows on the devotee the benefit through that alone. The devotee can invoke the Lord in a natural immobile thing, a rock, a stump, or an engraved picture, and worship Shiva by the sixteen upacharas, services and homage. He will attain supreme power of the Lord and gain knowledge by this practice. If the image is installed with pure mind on a pure altar, either by the gods or sages for the realization of the soul, it is called paurusha, and it comes under the category of the installed phallic image of Shiva. By regular worship of this phallic image, the devotee will attain all paurusha aishwarya, human riches. If great brahmanas or rich kings install a linga prepared by artisans, it is called pratishta and prakrita. 
it accords enjoyment of prakrita aishwarya, natural riches, to the worshipper. That which is forceful and permanent is called parusha. That which is weak and temporary is called prakrita. The spiritual and mobile form is represented by the constituents of the body, the penis, navel, tongue, the tip of the nose, hips, etc. The mountain comes under the Paurusha class and the surface of the world under the Prakrita class. Trees, etc. are Paurusha and creepers, etc. are Prakrita. The Shashtika rice is Prakrita, but rice of the Shali variety and wheat are Paurusha. The Aishwarya Linga is Paurusha. It bestows eightfold cities, anima, etc. The Prakrita Linga bestows good women, riches, etc., according to the believers. Now, first of all, I shall mention the Rasa Linga from among Chara Lingas. Rasa Linga is mentioned as the foremost among mobile Lingas. Rasa Linga is a bestower of all wishes to the Brahmanas. The auspicious Bana Linga is a bestower of vast kingdoms to the Kshatriyas. A gold Linga bestows the ownership of vast wealth on the Vaishyas. A Shila Linga made of rock bestows great purity on the Shudras. A crystal Linga and a Bana Linga bestow all sort of wishes on all. If a devotee does not possess a Linga of his own, there is no harm in using another's Linga for worship. An earth linga shall be used by women, especially by those whose husbands are alive. In the case of widows who are engaged in worldly and sacred rites, a crystal linga is recommended. 